My topic is how to make da'wah to non-Muslims. So something we have to understand initially is that the word da'wah means a call or a summons or an invitation. So an invitation can be rejected. Uh, so this goes back to a principle that we have in our religion, la ikraha fid din, that there is no compulsion in our religion. I can't force you to believe in something. I can't inject iman into your heart. Right? I can force you to do something, and of course I'll never do that. Right? But I can't force you to believe in something. Now, what's interesting is that on the auspicious date of September 12th, a few years ago, the Pope of the Catholic Church, he actually quoted this verse, right, La Ekraha Fiddin, in a speech he gave in Germany. And he said that this verse uh, is mansukh, it's been abrogated, because it's a Meccan ayah, it was revealed in Mecca, right? So what's interesting here is that the Catholics believe that the Pope is infallible in his doctrine, but he's just plain wrong here. This verse is from what surah? Does anyone know the name of the surah? La ikraha fid din. It's from Al-Baqarah, which is a Medinan surah. Uh, and then he said that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not bring anything new. Right? Do you guys remember this speech by the Pope? You know, it's really interesting. So he didn't bring anything new. What's interesting about that comment is that the dominant philosophy in theology in the Roman Catholic Church is based on a text called the Sumo Theologica by a medieval Dominican monk named St. Thomas Aquinas. And St. Thomas Aquinas was heavily influenced by the likes of Abu Ali al Hussein, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Abu Hamad al Ghazali, and many other Muslim philosophers and uh, theologians. You know, in the early days of the Christians, the look, if you look at the first few centuries, during the time of the uh, early church fathers, there was a church father named Tertullian of Carthage. And Tertullian was debating a pagan, right, named Chelsus, about the Trinity. And they were going back and forth. And at the end, Tertullian said, I believe in the Trinity because it is absurd. That was his final that was his final comment. It's absurd, that's why I believe in it. Now a thousand years later, however, you have Thomas Aquinas coming out and saying uh, that there's a book of reason and a book of revelation, that there's aql and naql. Well, where did he get that from? You know, He came out and said there's four cardinal virtues right, of shuja'a and adala and ifa and hikmah. So all of these types of things he acquired from his contact or his studies indirectly from Muslim theologians and philosophers. Rene Descartes, who uh, is the father of Western uh, philosophy, um, he was a Frenchman who lived in the 17th century. He is a staunch defender of occasionalism, of creationism, defending God's omnipotence. And he took that directly from the incoherence of the philosophers by Al-Ghazali. And he was a very devout Catholic. So when the Pope says that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not bring anything new, um, basically he brought the Catholic Church's entire philosophy and theological system. Does it make a lot of sense? So the ulama say that half of da'wah is dua, is supplication. Some say nine-tenths of da'wah is dua, supplication. And supplication, according to the hadith of Bukhari, at dua mukhul ibadah, that supplication is the essence of worship. It's the bone marrow of worship. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Imam Tirmidhi, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَكْرَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مِنَ الدُّعَى أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالسَّلَامِ That nothing is more honored in the sight of God than supplication. So we have to learn how to pour our hearts out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and earnestly and sincerely seek for the guidance of humanity because this is a prophetic concern. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
was in a battle on the day of Ghazwat Uhud and there was blood coming from his blessed face. He was reportedly trying to keep the blood from striking the earth. And his companions asked him, why are you doing that? And he said, because if one drop of this blood should strike the earth, then immediately punishment will come upon our enemies who are fighting us. And then a short time later, they saw him with his hands raised. And he said, Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. God, guide my people, for they don't know. So the Prophet wasallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, was praying for his enemies, even in the thick of battle. Because of this prophetic concern, he said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسي. أو كما قال. He said that none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith, have commented on this, on this hadith of the Prophet, this statement of the Prophet, and have said that the word brother in this hadith doesn't simply mean your brother in Islam, but rather your brother or sister amongst humanity. In other words, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is appealing to humanity. His message is universal. His message is cosmopolitan. He was sent as a mercy unto all the worlds. And what is al alamin? Kullama siwallah. Everything except God is al alamin. So it's incumbent upon uh, sentient beings um, to believe in his message, which are jinn and ins. We can establish taklif or responsibility upon jinn and ins because they have a limited free will. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, is also sent to the earth. He's sent to animals. He's sent to angels. How is he a mercy unto the angels? It's reported in the story of the night journey and ascension that when the Prophet visited or saw the hellfire accompanied by the archangel Gabriel, the guardian of hell named Malik saw the Prophet وسلم, and smiled for the first time in his life. And then he's never smiled after that. The very countenance of the Prophet ﷺ brought joy to people's hearts. So there are many methodologies as to how to make da'wah. There's the passive and the active. So some people believe that if you're going to make da'wah to people, you have to give a speech of some sort. One of my teachers said that sometimes the best type of da'wah is just to keep our mouth shut. Because oftentimes Muslims do more damage when they speak. Right? So da'wah is wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wa nu'idhati al hasana wa jadil hum bil latihi ahsan. Call humanity to the way of thy Lord with wisdom, with hikmah, and wise exhortation. So we, know how, we have to know how to change things up. It's not just a script that we read for people. Right? So if we're, for example, if we're talking to a group of elementary school students, that's going to be very different than a speech or a lecture that we deliver uh, at a Christian seminary, right? The content will be different. The message will be essentially the same, but the content will be different. And the Prophet وسلم, he spoke all of the dialects of the Arabs. He would speak to an Arab in his dialect because he would immediately, in, in, he would immediately uh, endear himself to his heart by speaking a person's language. He sent Mus'ab ibn Umar into Medina before the Hijrah. Why did he send him there? To speak with the people and get to know them. This is the Aus, the Khazraj, the Bani Quraidha, the Bani Nadir. The Prophet وسلم, he wanted information about the tribes in Medina so he can tailor the message. It wasn't haphazard, right? It wasn't just a fly of the moment type of thing. He wanted to do his research, وسلم. He sent Zayd ibn Thabit who is one of the chief scribes of the Prophet, to live with a group of Jews to learn the Hebrew language. Right? And Zayd learned the Hebrew language in 18 days. And if you know Arabic, you can learn Hebrew very quickly. Right? And why did he do that? To make the da'wah more effective. So for the general masses, the best da'wah that we can make, the most effective da'wah that we can make as, as general masses, is to have good character, husnul khuluq, right? Have good character. The Prophet said in a hadith, "Inna ma bu'ithu li utammi ma makarim al akhlaq." 
I was only sent to perfect your character. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him in the Quran, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُوكٍ عَظِيمٍ That verily, and there's, there's, there's emphasis in this ayah twice. The inna harfa tawkid, the lamb, is also for emphasis, right? Ala, meaning on top of, to dominate something. Verily, verily, you dominate magnificent character. So, I'm going to be talking about two types of da'wah. Behavioral da'wah, an intellectual or academic. And these are not mutually exclusive, right? If you consider yourself an academic, it doesn't excuse you from having good adab with people. In reality, it's all based on your behavior. So let's look at some of the manifestations of husnul khuluq in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, according to our uh, prophetology, the science of, of prophets, was the best of creation. Yet he had humbleness. He had tawadur. He said, مَن تَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ وَمَن تَكَبَّرَ وَدَعَهُ اللَّهِ أو كَمَا قَالَ He said, whoever exalts himself will be debased, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So there's an inverse relationship. It's paradoxical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ Many times Muslims, they only quote the first part of this verse, and then they push the pause button, right? كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ Pause. We're the best people. Khalas. Listen to the rest and Ukhrijat Linnas. What does that mean? What is the significance of Linnas? Right? For the service of humanity, according to the exegetes of the Quran. That you're only great if you serve humanity. Right? The Prophet ﷺ was extremely humble. When they were going out to Ghazwat Badr, there was a shortage of camels to ride. So three men had to had to share one camel. So the Prophet ﷺ was sharing a camel with Sayyidina Ali and Abu Lubaba. So two men would ride, one would walk, and then they'd rotate, right? So it, it came time for the Prophet ﷺ to walk. And his two companions, Ali and Abu Lubaba, they said, نَحْنُ نَمْشِي عَنْكَ Don't worry about it. We'll walk for you. Go ahead, you can ride. The Prophet said, مَا أَنْتُمَا بِأَقْوَى minni." Neither of you are as strong as I am. And I am not in, in need of less and I am not less in need of reward than you two. So the first statement is true. The Prophet is extremely physically strong, has a strength of 70 men. The second statement is from his tawadur. It's from his humility, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet وسلم, he used to acknowledge children and used to play with children. And this was seen as something that was unmanly at the time amongst the, the desert Arabs. He was kissing his grandsons one time, al Hassanain, and a tough Bedouin came and said, you kiss your children. I have 10 sons and I've never kissed a single one of them. Right? He was proud of this idea. I've never kissed my son. Right? The Prophet said, there's nothing in my religion uh, for people who have no compassion in their hearts. When he was standing on the minbar giving a khutbah, his grandson, Imam Hussein, came into the masjid, here following the voice of his grandfather. The Prophet descended the minbar, picked up his grandson, reascended the minbar, and finished his khutbah, carrying his grandson in his arms. Right? We get mad if we're trying to watch TV, and our son comes and wants to play with us. He's giving a khutbah during Friday services. When Fatima would come into the room, the Prophet's daughter, the Prophet would get up and give his seat to her and kiss her on the hands. He would greet children, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Al-Badiyu bis salami bari'un min al-kibr. The one who initiates a greeting is free from arrogance. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was very hard to preempt him in giving salam. It was very hard to say salam to him before he gave it to you. Even with children, he would beat them to the salam. With children. I mean, this is how humble he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he wouldn't talk down to them. He wouldn't look down and talk to children because it was very imposing. It, they didn't, he didn't want to scare them. He would actually get down at their eye level and speak to them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His wife, Aisha, was asked, كَيْفَ كَانَ رَسُولُ فِي الْبَيْتِ What did the Prophet do in the household? She said, كَانَ فِي مِهْنَةِ أَهْلِهِ He was in the service of humanity. 
He was in the service of his family. I'm sorry. In the service of his wife. What was he doing? Menial jobs around the house. In another hadith, she says, Basharan min al-bashar. He was just a man amongst men. You know, he would fix his sandals. He would milk his own goat. He would serve himself. So the Lord said, sit around for someone to serve him. Right? Like a king sits in his throne. Go serve me. Bring me some chai. Bring me some coffee. Bring me the biryani. Whatever it is. He would serve himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would stand until his feet were swollen, right, in prayer. And his wife said, this is related three times by Imam uh, Tirmidhi, Abu Isa Tirmidhi in the Shema'il. Three consecutive times. He wants to stress this point, that the Prophet would stand until his feet were swollen. And he was asked, why do you do this? And he said, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura." Should I not be a grateful servant, right? The worship of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, transcends just fulfilling a commandment. He worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu was courteous. There was a Jewish boy who would come and sit in his majalis sometimes. And he would, he would ask to do you know, certain things. And the Jewish boy didn't show up a few times. So the Prophet went out looking for him. And it turns out that he's actually on his deathbed. He's going to die. The Prophet went to his house and asked him to become Muslim. And the Jewish boy looked at his father, and his father said, Atir Abu Qasim, obey Abu Qasim. And he became Muslim and he passed away. The Prophet ﷺ, he visited sick children. He visited the brother of Anas, who was six or seven years old, because his pet bird died. Right? <laughs> the brother of Anas had a bird called a Nughair, right? It was a nightingale. And his pet bird died. And he was crying. And the Prophet ﷺ, who is Imam al-Mursaleen, he is the, the leader of the messengers of God. He goes to this boy's house and he says, He's, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughair. Right? He wants to make him feel better. The, the bird's name was Umair. So he uses a kunya. He's, Ya Aba Umair, oh father of Umair, to cheer him up. Ma fa'ala nughair. What did the bird used to do? Tell me about the bird. And he said, oh, the bird used to sing this song and that song. This is the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, humoring a six or seven year old boy. Right? We have to think about this. He stood for the man's funeral. He went, to the, he went for the, uh, there was a, a neighbor of his who used to put garbage on his, we know the story, on his front porch. And he would remove it with a stick. One day the garbage isn't there. So he goes again, searching around for her. She's not abusing me today. What happened to her? You know, she's also very ill. Right? And back, you know, and she... He sat with her and immediately she became, she became Muslim. Because back then, people were very tribal. They weren't as individualistic as they are today. Right? It was very tribal. They make taqlid of their leaders. So back then, she was thinking something like, you know, Abu Lahab is making fun of him. Abu Jahal is doing that. Al-Walid ibn Mughira is doing this. These are our leaders, so I'm going to do it. This is how Islam spread over North Africa. Right? Because, you know, the Orientalists will try to say that the Muslims forced people and killed people and so on and so forth. They don't under, there's no historical consciousness of what happened at the time. Right? This is when, this, this, when Sa'd ibn, uh, uh, Musa ibn uh, Umar went to Medina, they told him to talk to Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, who was the chief of one of the tribes. Because if he converts, the entire tribe will convert. So this woman sat with the Prophet ﷺ a few moments and she became Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, had excellent disposition. Sahlul khuluq, layinul janib. He was a very easygoing disposition, right? easy to talk to. He had gentleness. In the Shema'il, it's related, he had mutawasilul ahzan, which is translated as he was always grief stricken. But it also says da'imul bishr, that he was always happy. So, how do we reconcile these two? So, the ulama say that when the Prophet was in his solitude, when he was in his solitude, that he had the appearance of being grief-stricken. But it wasn't really grief. It was a contemplation. This is a man who had seen an angel. This is a man who saw paradise and saw the hellfire. Right? So he was in this extreme type of muraqaba. He was raptured in the presence of his Lord. He wasn't grieving. He was contemplative. But, so when he was with the khaliq, mutawasil al-ahzan, he had the appearance of being grief-stricken. But when he was with the makhluk, when he was with the people, 
Bishra. He was always happy. He was always smiling. Abdullah ibn Hada said, Ma ra'aytu ahadan akthara tabassuman min Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa I never saw anyone smile more than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha and Ali, they both relate a hadith, and it's significant that it comes from these two people because they were raised in the Prophet's household from a very young age, nine or ten years old. They said, Lam, lam yadrib Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam imra'atan aw ghulaman aw waladan qat. The Prophet sallallahu he never struck a woman, a child, or a servant sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had gentleness. He didn't do things like that. We all know the story of the Bedouin who came and relieved himself in the mosque. You've probably heard the story millions of times. And if you, if you haven't heard it, you're going to hear it again. So the Bedouin came. Maybe you haven't heard the end of the story. What happened at the end of the story? Because when the Bedouin was relieving himself, فَقَامَ nasu ilayhi. Some of the Sahaba got up to address the situation, which is a way of saying that they were going to attack him. Right? And the Prophet prevented that and came to the Bedouin, who's rough around the edges, and he said, you know, this is a masjid and we don't do these things. He didn't know any better. He showed him lean, showed him gentleness. Right? So then he became Muslim. He washed himself and he prayed with them. And as the Bedouin was leaving, he shouted, Allahumma irhamni wa Muhammadan, wa la tarham ma'ana ahadan. May Allah have mercy on me and on Muhammad and nobody else. And he pointed to the Sahaba that tried to attack him. Fadahikan Nabi. The Prophet laughed. He thought that was funny. And he said, Don't constrict something that's vast. The Prophet had a sense of humor. There's a whole chapter in the book of the Shama'il and Nabawiyyah called the joking, the jesting of the Prophet. Right? The Prophet وسلم, he always spoke the truth and he would become angry. But he, they wouldn't know he was angry because he wouldn't act like we do when we get angry. When we get angry, we throw things, we start shouting. Right? We start beating people. A'udhu Billah. The only reason, the only way the Sahaba can tell if the Prophet was angry is because his face would turn red and there would be a vein between his, his, his eyebrows that would protrude. That's the only way they can know he's angry. Right? So they asked him, should we write things down from you even when you're angry? He said, la yakhruju minhu illa al haq He's by the one who sent me in truth. Nothing comes from this except the truth. Write down anything that I say. Everything he said was tempered. It was guidance. The Prophet was the most truthful of human beings. There's two hadith of Amr ibn al-As who was shown so much love to the Prophet wasallam that he came to the Prophet one day. And remember, Amr ibn al-As used to be an enemy of the Prophet. He fought against him in many battles. Then he became Muslim. The Prophet showed him love. right? And then he comes to the Prophet one day and he says, Ayyun nas ahabbu ilayk, who do you love the most? Expecting the Prophet to say, it's you, isn't it obvious? Right? And he said, Aisha. He said, his wife, he loves his wife. Right? And this was also seen as something unchivalrous for that time. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't seen as manly for a man to say, I love my wife. Right? He loved his wife, but he'd never admit it. Oh, that woman, yeah, whatever. But then he'd go home and the, I love you and so on and so forth. But he said it very clear, Aisha. And then he said, Mina Rijal, from the men. Who do you love from the men? And he said, Abu Ha, her father. Again, her father. Thummaman, Umar, Fa'adda Rijalan. And then he named a few other men, meaning he wasn't one of them. In another hadith, he says, Waditu anni lam akunu sa'altuhu. I wish I never asked him that question, because I thought I was the most beloved. But the Prophet was always truthful, right? He didn't say things to people just to placate them, just to make them feel good. He was truthful when he said things. Right? Like the story of Suraka bin Malik. You guys know the story of Suraka bin Malik? When the Prophet was making hijrah, Suraka bin Malik wanted 100 camel bounty to bring the Prophet back to Mecca. So he chases after the Prophet. He finds him in the desert. Suraka bin Malik was a master tracksman. Right? And he sees the Prophet وسلم, and immediately he's thrown from his horse. And he was an intelligent man. And he said to himself, I've never fallen from my horse. This is the first time in my life. Right? There's something about this man. So he says to the Prophet, وسلم, guarantee me safety. Right? See, the tables have turned. 
He's come to turn in the prophet for a bounty, and now he's asking the prophet for a guarantee of safety. So he says, I guarantee you safety. He says, why have you come? And Suraka says, 100 nuk, 100 she camels. And he says, can you give me something better? And the prophet said, yes. He said, kaifa? He said, kaifa bika idha labista siwara kisra. He said, how does it grasp you that you're going to wear the bracelets of Kisra, the king of Persia? And this came true many, many years later. And Suraka bin Malik, even though he was not a Muslim at the time and wanted to turn the Prophet in for a bounty, he told the Prophet, can you write it down for me? Because the Meccans are not going to believe me. He knew the Prophet is truthful. He's a Sadiq al-Amin. This is a name his enemies gave him. This is not a name that his companions gave him. His enemies before Islam gave him this name, As-Sadiq al-Amin, the truthful one. So this is, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us engender and cultivate these prophetic characteristics. This is the most effective method of da'wah, is good character. The most effective method of da'wah is this. And now we're going to switch some gears and now go to some intellectual academic things. So there was a Muslim scholar named Abu Bakr al-Baqalani during the Abbasid Empire. And he was a brilliant man. And he used to get invited to debate with Christian scholars. So he was invited to debate a Christian king one day outside of the empire somewhere. So he goes to this king's palace and he goes to enter the throne room where the king was sitting. And he noticed that the throne room, the door to the throne room, was only about this high, about as high as a man's waist, right? And the reason that it was that high is because this king obviously had some issues. He wanted people to bow to him <laughs> as soon as they entered into the throne room, right? So Abu Bakr Bakalani is waiting outside this throne room and thinking, how am I going to enter into this room without bowing to this king? So he thought, you know, I have an idea. So he turned around and he went in backwards, right? And then the king says to him, you know, wasn't one of the wives of your prophet uh, accused of adultery? His response was, there were two great women accused of adultery. One provided a child, one did not. And who is he talking about? He's talking about Maryam, Mary, alayhi salam. So a lot of times it's just kind of exposing this kind of hypocritical methodology in people. Like you read a lot of, I read a lot, I don't advise doing this, but I have to do it for my job, I guess. I read a lot of, you know, polemicist apologetics written by Christians against Islam. And they, for example, they attack the marriage of the Prophet with uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, right? And you hear this a lot coming from the Christian camp. What's interesting is that the proto-gospel of James, people don't, we have to, we, no, nobody knows about these things, right? The proto-gospel of James, written in the second century, was revered by Christians of the second century as being the word of God. It didn't make it into the Bible, but that's a different story. But it says in that document that Mary was 12 years old at the time when she got married to Joseph the Carpenter. 12 years old, right? The New Advent Encyclopedia says that she was 12 years old. I, I asked a Russian uh, or Orthodox priest one day, I said, how old was Mary when she married Joseph? Right? How old? And he said that she was 11 years old. And Joseph was 90. So he had, <laughs> he had grandchildren older than his wife. Right? Or they say something like, I don't accept the Prophet ﷺ because he participated in battles. He fought in Ghazawat, Maghazi, these military expeditions. So I don't believe he's a prophet. Right? Now, if you counted up all of the casualties and all of the battles of the Prophet, enemy and Muslim casualties, right? Over 23 years, this is in war. This isn't, yani, this is in war. Enemy and Muslim casualties. Sheikh Abu Hassan al Nadawi says there was 1,018 in the entire life of the Prophet, 1,018 in war, in battle situations, right? In Exodus chapter 32 in the Torah, we are told that when Musa alayhi salam, he descends Mount Sinai, sees his people worshipping the golden calf, and he orders 3,000 of his own men killed on the spot in one night. So it seems kind of strange. 
I don't accept the Prophet ﷺ because he participated in battles. Moses, who is accepted as a prophet by these people, killed three times as many men in one night. Right? So we have to expose that. This is hypocrisy. Right? So when dealing with Ahlul Kitab, it's not black and white. Now, one of the most interesting um, aspects we can bring up is fulfillment of prophecy. So, Justin Martyr, who was a second century Christian uh, scholar, he, uh, he wrote a book called, and this is, he's the, the architect of Logos theology, right? This idea that Jesus is the word of God. He wrote a book called Dialogue with Trypho the Jew, in which he tries to prove that Jesus is the Messiah based on fulfillment of prophecy, right? This is the strongest argument he can make to convince the Jew. Not miracles, but fulfillment of prophecy. For example, it says in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that a young woman, some say it says virgin, actually says a, a young woman, shall have a son and his name is Emmanuel. And Christians say that this is a reference to Jesus, peace be upon him. But if you read the very next chapter, Isaiah chapter 8, it says that Emmanuel is born to King Ahaz. How can this be a reference to Jesus? So traditional Christian exegetes, like Origen of Alexandria will say, you, have to, you see there are, there, are, there are multiple levels of meaning in scripture. Multiple levels of meaning. So there's an exoteric meaning, contextualized historically. But then there's an esoteric meaning, which foreshadows something to happen in the future. In this case, the birth of the Jewish Messiah. Right? And this is something that is not foreign to our tradition. We don't want to get into a theological discussion, but the difference between the kalam lafzi and the kalam nafsi wal qadim is vast according to our theology. The, uh, the speech of God through uh, modes of expression and the amodal speech of God, which is infinite in its meanings. So we have to, we have to understand how they approach the scripture. The scripture has multiple levels of meaning. And I advise Muslims to do some research as far as uh, historical dates, right, in Judeo-Christian history, like 325, Council of Nicaea, 381, Council of Constantinople, 421, 553. These are very important dates, right? So when the Prophet wasallam, when he came into Medina, there was a rabbi in Medina named Abdullah ibn Salam, and he says, he relates the hadith himself. He says, Araftu wajahu laysa bi wajhi He says, I can tell by looking at his face, it wasn't the face of a liar. Right? So the ulama say, how can he tell that? Perhaps the Prophet had an honest looking face. Or perhaps he recognized the Prophet ﷺ based on some sort of description of him in his scripture. So this is uh, very important for us to um, to research. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ أَتَيْنَ الْهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُمْ Those who receive the previous dispensations, they know the Prophet ﷺ like they know one of their own sons. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيُ الْأُمِّ Right? Those who follow the Messenger, the unlettered Prophet, whم they find mentioned, مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَةِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Who's mentioned in the Torah and in the Gospel. This is what the Quran says. And Nabi al Ummi has three possible meanings according to the Mufassirin, the exegetes of the Quran. It could mean either a motherly prophet, a motherly, because Umm means mother, a motherly prophet, right? Meaning a prophet that has uh, Jalali attributes as well as Jamali attributes. Or it could mean an unlettered prophet, no formal education. Or it could mean a Gentile prophet, because the word for Gentile, or goy, the word is goy in Hebrew, which means a non-Jewish person. The word for Gentile in Arabic is ummi. Laysa alayna fil ummiyina sabil. Right? There's no, like it says in the Quran. So it could mean the Gentile prophet. Now I want to share with you, to give you an example of what I'm talking about. I hope I'm not boring people here. There's a book in the Old Testament called Shir Hashirim. Right? Song of Songs. Shir Hashirim, 
And this is a way of saying the most beautiful songs. Right? This is a superlative in, in the Hebrew language. Like if you want to say the best king, you would say the king of kings. The best book is the book of books. The best song is the song of songs. This was written uh, 3,000 years ago, according to uh, the traditional opinion. So I wanted to quote some of it to you. This is really interesting. But before I do that, we have to establish a few things. That one of the titles of the Prophet Wasallam is the beloved of God. So you have a Sadiq, you have a Khalil, and then you have a Habib, right? So Ibrahim, Abraham is the intimate friend of God, but above and beyond that you have the beloved of God, right? So the Sahaba were talking about the stations of the prophets one day, and they were saying Abraham is a friend of God, Moses spoke to God, Jesus is the spirit of God. The prophet walked by and he said, وَأَنَا حَبِيبُ اللَّهِ But I am the beloved of God. وَأَنَا سَيِّدُ وَلَدِ آدَمْ وَلَا فَخَرْ And I am the master of the children of Adam, and I do not boast. So we believe he's the beloved of God. During the conquest of Mecca, the prophet entered the city with 10,000 companions. He was the leader of 10,000 men. And he declared general amnesty on that day. Right? Now, according to the Shama'il, in the hadith of Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, who's one of the grandsons of Ali, he describes the Prophet, The Prophet's face was round, rounded. Not completely round, but more round than slim. Which means white with a redness, with a red tinge. Right? Hind ibn Abi Hala, in another hadith in the Shama'il, who was the maternal uncle of Imam Hussein and Hassan, he describes the Prophet's complexion as azharul loan, as a pink complexion. Of course, pink is what you get when you mix white and red. Azhar can also mean uh, a luminous complexion. So he's beloved of God, he's the, the chief of 10,000 men, and he's white and red in his complexion. So let's read the first line of the Song of Songs, Shira Hashirim, chapter 5, verse 10, says in the Hebrew language, which was written 3,000 years ago, Dodi Sakhba Adom, my beloved is white and red. Degul Mervava, the leader of 10,000 men. It goes on to say in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, that his hair wasn't curly nor straight, but between the two, he had wavy hair. He also says in a hadith that when the Prophet was in his 60s, he says, that he did not have more than 20 white hairs on his head and in his beard in his 60s. So he had very dark hair. So, we go back to the Song of Songs. It says, Rosho ketim paz, his head is like gold. Givut sotav tel talim, his locks are wavy. Shakhrat ka orev, and black as a raven. Right? Now what's interesting here is that the word orev in Hebrew is made up of three letters. Ayin, Resh, Ayin, Resh, and Ba, or Arab. So this is also the word for Arab, right? You can actually translate this, black like an Arab. His hair is black like an Arab, but I haven't seen a translation like that for obvious reasons. Next part says, so in the, in the Shema'il, the hadith of Ibrahim ibn Muhammad, it says, Ad'ajul aynain, that he had big, dark, and deep eyes. Ahdabul ashfar, long lashes. Jullan nadrihi al mulahada, that his his, his, gla his glance was, uh, was passing. In other words, that he wouldn't stare at things, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would just glance and look away. Nadruhu ila al-ard akthara min nadrihi ila sama That he would be more looking towards the earth than the heavens. Song of Solomon. And I'm just quoting some highlights here. This is obviously not all of the passage here in the Hebrew Bible. A naif kayonim, his eyes are like the eyes of doves, which are very big and black and delicate, dark. 
So then we'll get to the hadith of Abu Huraira who says, Can Rasulullah Abyad, the Prophet was white in complexion, as if he was sculpted from silver. His neck had looked like the ivory neck of a statue in the clarity of silver. Right? So verse 15 in the Hebrew says, May av eshet shain, that his body looks like carved ivory. Merahu right? kal yonim, that his uh, countenance is like Lebanon, which is, means white, not a pasty white, but like milk type of, a dark milk. And then verse 16 says in the Hebrew, Chikko mamthakim, that his mouth is sweet. Vikullo Muhammadim. He is altogether lovely. Zihdudi. This is my beloved. Vizihri. This is my friend. Banu Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem. So Chikko Mamthakim Vikullo Muhammadim. This is the actual name of the Prophet. So this again is the strongest, according to Justin Martyr, this is the strongest case that we can make for the Prophet is fulfillment of prophecy. I know I'm running out of time here, I'm sorry. So it's very important that before a Muslim can even make da'wah in the active sense, uh, he or she must have some knowledge of their own theology. So what, what's going on right now, unfortunately, is that there's uh, a faith crisis amongst the Muslim community uh, based on some sort of intellectual trauma. Because Muslims, they don't study theology anymore. A Muslim, it's wajib upon every Muslim to have some sense of theology. Right? And when there's a lack of theology, there's a lack of real gnosis of God. And gnosis leads to love, right? The path to mahabba is ma'rifa. You can't love something you don't know unless it's a love that's based on intellect, called al-hubbul aqli, right? which is possible, but it's not a real type of love unless you know that person. Right? So it's incumbent upon Muslims to study some level of usul al-deen or al-fiqh al-akbar, theology. Not to the point where you can construct these polemical responses to different types of deviant groups or whatnot, but just enough to protect yourself because, you know, the youth at 16, 17, 18 years old, they're hearing a lot of things from the university professor, and the university professor has a PhD, so he must know what he's talking about. He has a PhD, right? Or this, this guy, this puppet on TV, He's, he's on TV, so, you know, obviously he's credible, right? And he's saying this, all these things, and it's very confusing for youth. But if he has that knowledge of theology, he can set up a protection against that type of thing. So intellectual proof to deal with, you know, the, the, the neo-atheists. Have you heard of the neo-atheists? Like these guys like Dawkins and Hitchens. And, right? This is very appealing for some reason, Sam Harris, to young people. These are the neo-atheists. These aren't like the, the OGs, the original gangsters of atheism, like Nietzsche and Freud, right, and Karl Marx. I mean, those people actually studied theology and they actually uh, considered what would actually happen if there was no religion in the world. There would be chaos. But the, the neo-atheists, it seems like they say, you know, if, if, if every mosque or a church was converted into a Starbucks, it would be much better. It doesn't work like that, right? So there's a major movement of apostasy right now, actually, going on in Europe. People are leaving Christianity in massive groups in Europe, right? So this is going on. So one of the biggest proofs that we can actually use against this is that the vast majority of humanity, the vast majority of humanity since the beginning of human civilization has believed in a higher being, a supreme being. Right? There's been an internal calling for a deeper understanding. The vast majority of humanity. And the atheist feels that as well. But the irony is, he takes that 
and he rebels against it and tries to prove that there is no God, whereas that is actually the calling of God towards him. So someone like Dawkins will say, belief in God, because there, obviously for him there needs to be some sort of natural explanation. He'll say that uh, it's a virus in the human DNA. Well, if it's a virus, it should be weeded out eventually, but it's not being weeded out. Even today in this postmodern world, the world of technology, the vast majority of people still tend to believe in God. Why? Because that's the nature of epistemology, the nature of knowledge, is that the, the more one actually acquires knowledge, the more one comes to know that in reality, he or she doesn't know anything, right? It's like what the brain surgeon says. He studies the brain. He said, I thought I knew something of about the brain, and then I did more research, and I noticed I didn't know anything, right? So the more one studies, the more one comes to realize that uh, we don't know anything in reality. So the Quran doesn't really go out and prove that Allahu mawjood, Allah exists. It's taken for granted that God exists, but rather that Allah is wahid, that he's unique, right? <clears throat> it's a clarification of who God is. So I'm, I'm totally out of time. I have to stop talking. Um, I can tell people are getting antsy. I just want to finish with this one story. Just two minutes, inshallah. Um, Abu Hanifa who is known as a jurist, but before he was a jurist, he was a mutakallim. He was a theologian. He used to actually debate against the sectarians, right? And he would debate atheists. And one day he was teaching his uh, class uh, outdoors. It was a beautiful day in Kufa in Iraq. And an atheist approaches him and says to him, you, you're, a, you're a, a Muslim scholar. He says, yes. He says, answer these questions for me. He says, go ahead, ask your questions. He says, why do you believe in God when you can't see God? Why do you believe in God if you can't see God? And how is Satan punished with fire when he's made from fire? And number three, why does God take you to account for things that he knows you're going to do anyway? Answer these three questions for me. And all the students are waiting for Abu Hanifa to answer these questions. So Abu Hanifa, he thinks about it for a minute, and then he reaches over, grabs some dirt, makes a nice little ball out of the dirt, and then throws it at this guy's head and hits him right between the eyes. Right? So the man is shocked, and then he leaves. So then a few days later, a summoner comes to Abu Hanifa and says, you know, this man, he wants to see you in court. You know, he wants to sue you for damages, right? So Abu Hanifa, he goes to the court, and the Qadi, the judge, asks him, why did you throw a clay ball at this man's head? And Abu Hanifa says, because I answered his questions. <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? He said, he left, he didn't let me explain. What's your explanation? He said that, why do you believe in God when you can't see him? Right? He can't see pain, but he knows it exists because he felt pain. So it exists. There's something that exists that you can't see. And then he said, he asked me, how is Satan punished by fire when he's made of fire? Right? So I took clay. He's made of clay. He's from Teen. He's from Turab. Right? Human being is made of dirt and clay. So I took some clay and punished him with it to let him know that I can punish him with clay even though he's made from clay. And the third one was that why does God take you to account for things that he knows that you're going to do? And he said, God knew before he created me that I was going to throw that clay ball at his head. And why am I being sued now? Why am I being taken to account for things that were already known by God? Right? And obviously there's a lot more examples like this, but I'm totally out of time. And I apologize for going over the time.